Greetings, ladies and mantle gents, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales of the Space. Space. And as always, I hope that you enjoy. To each their own dominion, written by nothing is artificial. The station was just short of utter chaos. Not since the war had there been such activity aboard this rather remote station. And this time, there were no klaxons or evacuation orders. Strictly speaking, there weren't many more beings on the station and dock ships than the past few dozen short cycles. But this short cycle, this moment, nearly every being was in the main promenade of the station. I saw the Volner station manager stride forward as the walls undulated, bringing attention to the manager's destination, a raised yet battered platform. We are all here to remember, to mourn, to reflect, to celebrate. One hundred long cycles ago, the war ended after nearly countless long cycles of occupation. The manager intoned somberly, as thousands of translators did their best to convey the words and meaning. Interspecies translation is always tricky, but there was little chance of misunderstanding why everyone was gathered here right now. The promenade erupted in a cacophony of approval. The station's atmosphere vibrated vigorously as the electromagnetic frequencies lit up chaotically. My translator helpfully told me the room was clapping. The station manager continued, May we never forget the price of self-determination. To each species, their own dominion. I screamed, To their own dominion! as the promenade filled with dozens of variants in a myriad of languages. Unusually tactful, my translator chose not to attempt to translate the obvious, and with that, the manager walked off the platform, and the festivities began. I can't say I care for the Volna, but they are consistently concise, and I've always been fond of them for that, despite the fact that I'm well known for being a long-winded myself. I found my way to one of the few establishments equipped to thoroughly intoxicate humans. It wasn't too packed, and I got what passes for a seat by a dispenser. There was a reputable group of beings clustered around. If I had to bet, all but two of them came from prominent families. Considering the festivities, unsurprisingly, they were already engaged in the perennial speculation of who attacked the occupiers and forced them to sign the armistice. It was obviously biological. The Sirius probe recently showed a vast ecosystem destruction rot there, and there was no elevated radioactive decay. The blue avian opposite me said, as my translator noted clear inebriation. Objections flew around the cluster. Most beings retorted with some variant of the leading theory. I took shot after shot as they spoke about how antimatter was somehow secreted to the planets and moons the occupiers. Everyone agreed the worlds had been consumed by vast storms. They were consistent with meteor impacts, but only the craziest of conspiracy theorists thought meteors were actually involved considering any decent defense system would annihilate such a target. The occupiers had by far the most advanced technology in the galaxy. Their defense systems were in great excess of decent. What about the contrails? provoked the vaguely simian being seated to my left. I smiled quietly to myself as I slowly sipped on a not-quite-wine-like drink. I was credibly drunk now and just looking to maintain my non-sobriety. The blue avian opposite me loudly rustled their feathers, exposing silvery portions of the inside of their wings. It was beautiful and captivating, but my translator made it clear that this was a display of utter disgust. As their wings settled back into place, the verbal assaults on the primate began. Complete nonsense. It's preposterous to create contrails in a vacuum of space. There is no way to generate so much thrust exhaust that it would be observed from light long cycles away. You kooks can observe anything if you stare at Sensitator long enough. Mo seated made the equivalent of nods as the avian finished their retort, except for the other simian sitting next to the first one. They looked like the same species to me, and in fact, I couldn't really tell them apart. They might have been related, but probably they weren't. Humans just didn't evolve to distinguish alien individuals from one another, even if they looked a bit like Terran apes. This maybe related simian was having none of it. 
33 moons and planets were attacked. For three of these worlds, we observed contrails, and most of the other worlds weren't being observed. For one of them, two different observatories in different star systems saw the same thing. This is not a hoax. Just because only young races happen to observe this doesn't mean they were crazy. Before the avian could rustle their feathers, I started speaking. This was simply too opportune a moment to not join the conversation. The contrail theory might not be conclusive, but they are right about us young races not being taken seriously. I'm sure mine is the youngest in the group right now. We were the youngest at the time of the armistice, and only one race has entered the community since. There was a fair bit of minor confusion in the group. I'm a human, soul system. Our home world is Earth. Beings quickly consulted their translators, and a general sense of understanding and indifference filled the group. So, you're saying your people also believe the hoaxes? Interrogated the clearly intoxicated avian. No, we believe in evidence. The Gondrail theory is strange, but is it stranger than the Occupy as being mysteriously attacked and ending the war only a few short cycles later? Well then, human, what do you think happened? The avian retorted. My species has a principle we like to use when solving problems. It's called Arkham's Razor. Not that I expect the translator for most of you. It says the simplest answer is often correct. Practically, everyone agrees the destruction was consistent with meteor impact. It's beyond improbable that many meteors by sheer chance simultaneously impacted the occupiers' worlds. And their defense system would have protected against typical meteors anyway. The simplest answer is a coordinated kinetic attack that evaded or overwhelmed their defenses. That all sounds reasonable, human, but yet makes no sense. There is a reason you young races aren't trusted. I don't suppose you know how their defenses were overwhelmed or evaded, the Avon retorted. Sure, accelerate a significant mass to near the speed of light. That'll overwhelm any planetary defense system that had only moments to respond. I replied, knowing that this was going to be deservedly challenged, but I was enjoying taking the evening along for the ride. Normally, I was more one for extensive monologues, but this drunk sparring was really hitting the spot right now. Again, your incomplete answer shows your lack of understanding of the occupiers, the avian said with disdain that I barely needed the translator to point out to me. You, of course, know they have FTL, and so they would intercept any inbound meteor well before collision if it were coming from out of the system. While I'll give you, if it were accelerated in system, maybe it wouldn't be intercepted. It's preposterous to think an acceleration track could be covertly assembled or moved into the occupier's systems undetected. Perfect. So, we agree that near-light-speed kinetic bombardment, not intercepted by their FTL ships, might make it past the planetary defense system, I said with glee. A massive grin spread across my face as the translator indicated the avian, as well as almost everyone else nearby was confused by my enthusiasm. Yet, I undeniably held their attention. All the avian could muster was, yes, but I hardly see the relevance. I agree, it's preposterous to have snuck an acceleration track into one of their systems, let alone 33. All it would take is to figure out how to make near light speed objects not be intercepted by their FDL ships. Oh, of course, so simple. Just do the impossible, that's all. It's not as if we haven't all been trying to sneak things past the occupiers for <laughs> mega cycles, the avian mocked. Sarcasm is a rare trait amongst intelligent beings, and is generally avoided in interspecies communication. Humans cared little for avoiding such behavior, and it was great to find a kindred spirit. The desire for at least a mini-monologue was rising up in me. The galactic community really is a nice place, minus the occupiers, that is. Us humans have enjoyed getting to know you all. You're very trusting. Very open. We don't say this too often, and so bluntly, but your attempts at secrecy and evasion are <laughs> cute. 
Earth had 12 geopolitical bodies when we entered the community. Surprised and confused looks all around. Perfect. Technically, we had one central one, uh, the United Nations, but it didn't do much. They just acted the part. We didn't lie to you all. We were just creative on how we answer your questions, sir. I know. Almost all species have only one government, and three is outright scandalous. The thing about having so many different groups with different interests is you're constantly being attacked. Subtly, generally not with lasers and antimatter. Others out to get strategic information. You learn how to evade and infiltrate. Even great strategies get found out quickly, and you constantly have to find new ones. During humanity's entire time observing the war, we saw you all trying variations of the same things over and over again. The improvements were staggeringly impressive, but utterly predictable. I definitely struck a nerve. Multiple beings started speaking over themselves at once until only one kept talking. The vaguely turtle-like being continued on. Not only are you foolish, you are arrogant. We may all despise the occupiers, but you seem incapable of learning from them. They occupied for so long because they had the technological advantage and relentlessly improved on it so we could not catch up. Their breakthrough invention of FTL gave them uncontested control of the galaxy, and despite megacycles, no other species has yet to develop FTL. Is it predictable others would try to develop FTL? Of course, because it is the right strategy. Is it predictable that we would improve our stealth shielding? Of course, because if we kept it up, one day we might be able to evade their senses. History has shown the relentless pursuit of ever more capable technologies win. I'm certain your species was still trying to figure out fire while many of ours had already begun a long and ultimately successful fight against the occupiers. I'd enjoyed your sparring until now, but your arrogance is beyond tolerance. You clearly have no better theories and wish only to antagonize us. I had hoped to be more captivating and less insulting, but I'm just an astrographer, and diplomatic communications aren't one of my specialties. I thought being genuinely drunk would have sufficed to smooth over my delivery, but I clearly miscalculated a bit. Hey, I was just trying to have some fun with you all. Sorry if I took it too far. I do have a better theory. You probably won't believe me anyway, but it explains everything, even the contrails. The equivalent of eye rolls and laughter came from my semi-voluntary audience, with the exception of the simians. Yeah, full of nonsense, but it is entertaining nonsense. Go on, said the avian with some genuine enthusiasm. Kinetic payloads going 82% of the speed of light impacted each of those 33 worlds. The masses buried so the worlds would be devastated, but not destroyed, and would eventually recover, although, admittedly, probably with rather different ecosystems. The seriousness of my tone and word choice had an effect on my fellow beings. There was no mockery being displayed by them for the moment. I doubt they believed me, but they were listening intently. They were not detected by the occupiers because they're used to you all trying to hide things in space. Ever more absorbent materials, scattering arrays, better sensors, evasion patterns, and so on. These payloads were hidden in time. Do you all know the major principle behind the stasis field? About half the group seemed to. Many scientific ideas were pretty freely shared between species, but most species' technologies were radically different and had no practical way to incorporate one another's. Stasis fields were reasonably common, but by no means pervasive. The relevant part to my story, my theory that is, is the anchor. In a stasis field, the anchor is used to keep an object, typically a container or room, fixed in time. But the anchor can also be used with substantial constraints to recall an object back to the point in space and time where the anchor previously was. The recall time window is very short. Most of its applications are rather esoteric, as the energy requirements are substantial, far higher than maintaining a stasis field. The avian and turtle-like beings both seem to be following, as did one other. Everyone else appeared engaged, but not really understanding. Well, 
At least that's what my translator told me. To my eyes, most of them hadn't changed their appearance in the slightest. So imagine a cylinder moving in a straight line. The front of the cylinder is an anchor. The rear has a recall beacon. Once the rear of the cylinder is where the front used to be, recall the cylinder. The cylinder moves back in time, but its position in space doesn't change. The same cylinder is now directly adjacent to itself. That's not possible, said the avian after quite a pause. Well, it could happen, but the timing would have to be absolutely perfect, and the energy needed would make this impractical. The avian seemed intrigued and lost in thought. I had a feeling the avian must have worked in power generation or propulsion. This is a good audience. Right, so the cylinder contains a large amount of antimatter. The avian moved its wings in a way that was apparently a thoughtful, if slightly doubtful, nod. When this is done repeatedly, the cylinder will for an instant appear very long and travel the full length instantaneously. Contrails, the two simians shouted almost simultaneously. Preposterous, said the avian, but with a serious lack of conviction. Even if this is possible, this couldn't be maintained long enough to be more than a spectacle. This can't be the means of propulsion. I'd bet a lot this very smart, if skeptical, bird worked in propulsion. I was making a mockery of his profession, I suppose. Oh well, best to break it in slowly over copious drinks. You're right, of course. As I said before, the kinetic payload is moving at 82% of the speed of light. It has no propulsion system, per se. It's on a predetermined course. This keeps getting ever more absurd. But I am entertained, so it has no engines, no ability to manipulate thrust. Once it does a recall jump, it'll be immediately off course. It'll have instantaneously moved while the rest of the universe has not. It'll have no ability to course correct. Damn, this bird was sharp. I wonder if we had a trade relationship with their species. I bet they had some pretty impressive creations if this is how quickly they thought when they were drunk. Right again. So it needs to do a predetermined number of recalls, and that's part of the planned trajectory. The simple case is it does all of them once it gets to within a certain distance of the target world, meaning it's moving instantaneously and cannot be intercepted, even by FTL ship. The group was silent for a while. I think most of them had generally followed, and the turtle and bird certainly had. The scenes just seemed happy I'd taken their side. That's quite a story, said the turtle, breaking the long silence. Thank you. My people are known for their creativity, I replied graciously. Humans are known for their creative stories, one of the simians said, clearly puzzled. No, although I think that's a shame. We have many wonderful stories. We're known for our creative solutions to very important problems. I said as I finished the last sip of my not-quite-wine. It was a pleasure swapping stories with you all, to each their own dominion. I shouted as I stumbled my way out of the bar. End of story. The algorithm reckons you should be watching this video next, and I recommend that you should be always watching my video. So, click and click with energy! And yes, clicking that does help the channel. Thank you very much. I would just quickly like to give thanks to our tier 5 members. Elithia, Barky, Feudicule, Meridian117, Cam Maxwell, Casper Arnholtz, Albarden Gusta, Savage Patch Papa, and Lord Azrakal.